My name is Ken Hayworth, and I want to make clear the following disclaimer. The Brain Preservation Foundation is a nonprofit science advocacy organization only. We do not offer preservation services, and we will never offer preservation services. And we are currently not endorsing any other company that may be offering preservation services. The mission of the Brain Preservation Foundation is solely to promote the science and application of brain preservation within the larger scientific and medical communities. So let me try to give you a concrete scenario that will help explain how I envision this working. Ten years from now, I get diagnosed with uh, a progressive Alzheimer's disease, and I'm given uh, just a few years to live. Well before my brain has completely been destroyed, I would schedule a procedure for undergoing brain preservation. Hopefully, I would schedule this procedure with with the help of my doctor in a regulated hospital setting. On that day when I go in for this procedure, I would be put under anesthesia, and at that point that would be the last thing that I would experience unless I get revived in the future. Under anesthesia, I would be wheeled in, I would have my chest opened up, be put on an artificial perfusion system, they would begin perfusing glutaraldehyde fixative throughout my vascular system. Almost immediately, every protein in every neuron in my brain would start to be cross-linked in place. That is what glutaraldehyde fixation means. It means you're more dead than a rock because you're gluing those biomolecules that are the metabolism that makes you alive, you're gluing those in place. You're not destroying the information, but you're destroying the operation. Once that glutaraldehyde has fixed everything in my brain and body and central nervous system, uh, I would then be perfused with cryoprotectant solution to a very high concentration so that uh, there's more cryoprotectant in all of the cells of my, of my brain and body than there is water. That allows me to be put in very low temperature, minus 130 degrees Celsius, so that instead of freezing, the remaining water molecules and the cryoprotectant forms a glassy solid that locks everything in place. At that point, time has essentially stopped for my brain. I could last that way for millennia without change. And yet, the information content of the brain has been preserved. This would probably be done on entire bodies, simply because that is easier to do if you want to preserve not only the brain, but also the spinal cord and much of the peripheral nervous system. Fast forward, let's say, 150 years. Now, I want you to think about that. 150 years ago, we didn't know hardly anything about how the brain works. We didn't have much of the technology that we have today. So if you're giving me 150 years into the future, I want you to also accept that we may have succeeded in our neuroscience quest to understand the brain at a computational level. So we are assuming that that future society really truly understands the brain. It understands how memory is encoded, it understands how to simulate brains, it's been doing that for quite some time, and it has the technology to scan brains. If we were going to sketch out that revival technology based upon what we do today, the first step would be to remove the brain and spinal cord. First of all, rewarm it so that it's again at room temperature. Now that's not a problem because this is a glutaraldehyde fixed brain. It's very stable even at room temperature. It would be hooked up to the same type of perfusion apparatus that initially put the cryoprotectant in and the glutaraldehyde in. But in this version, that perfusion apparatus would be used to remove the cryoprotectant. 
and would replace that with a set of staining solutions that would stain all of the membranes of the neurons. So right now, the techniques that we use for this is we would perfuse with osmium tetroxide that would stain and lock in place the lipids that make up the outer membrane of all the neurons and synapses. Then we would perfuse in other staining solutions like uranium salts that would stain the proteins that make up the synaptic structures. But we would probably, because this is the future, also stain with a host of other things that would tag individual types of molecules like ion channels and receptor proteins to make them visible in whatever scanning technology that will be used. At that point, the brain is, and, and spinal cord have been stained. You remove that and place it in a set of solutions designed to extract the, the remaining water from the brain and replace it with plastic resin. That plastic resin seeps into every nook and cranny of every cell in the brain and central nervous system. And then it is cured into a solid block. So at that point, I now have the brain and spinal cord in a solid state and all of it is stained in a way that can be viewed under the electron microscope. Machines would slice this up at perhaps 10, 20 micron thickness, the entire brain and the entire spinal cord, and would spread those thick sections among thousands of multiple beam scanning electron microscopes that would scan those slices at the 10 nanometer resolution on their top surface and then would ion mill 10 nanometers away before they image again. And they would image all the way through those thick sections. What I have described here is a method whereby uh, your brain has been scanned in its entirety at a resolution of perhaps 10 by 10 by 10 nanometers. We are scanning brain tissue today, small pieces, using this type of technique. This resolution is good enough to trace every single neuronal connection and every synapse, and to see the detailed structure of every synapse in order to estimate its, its functional strength. What do you do with this map of all 100 billion neurons and hundreds of trillions of synaptic connections. Well, you put that through computer processing in order to trace out all of those connections. And then with the, with the insight that has been gained by the last 150 years of neuroscience experimentation and knowledge, uh, you interpret that in order to build a simulation of that brain. And it's that simulation of that brain that can finally bring back a memory and bring back an individual because it is simulating one for one the types of representational processes that were going on in your original brain before any of this. The simulation would not be turned on until they have made sure that that simulation will operate properly and it will not be turned on until they have hooked it up to a virtual or robotic body so that when my mind comes back online, I can open up my eyes and look out at the world and say, wow, it worked. <laughs>